All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, this track is sponsored by NC Cardinal with live captioning made possible by Equinox Open Library Initiative. And we'd like to thank our captioner. We'd also like to thank the other conference sponsors for making this event possible, Mobius, Bibliomation, and Evergreen Indiana. The event is being recorded and will be available on YouTube following the conclusion of the conference. We'd like to encourage everyone to use the chat window to post questions. So please leave your uh, mics muted unless you're actually, uh, unless Rogan is asking for questions. <laughs> the facilitators <laughs> will be collecting your questions along the way and posing them to the presenter at the end of the session. So feel free to put your questions in there. We'd like to introduce the presenter for the sec session, Rogan Hamby from Equinox, who will be talking about working with MARC records in Perl. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Rogan Hamby. This was originally proposed as a pre-conference session where I was going to cover in the first half of the pre-conference sort of command line working with Perl and MARC records and in the second half, PL Perl, with the shift to an online uh, method of doing the conference and my not really being sure how that kind of presentation would work in this format. We've scaled it back a little bit, so I'm going to focus on what would have been the second half of the pre-conference and looking at PL Perl or Perl inside Postgres functions, which is going to be a pretty common use case. Now, I do encourage people to use the chat, ask questions. I'll try to keep an eye on chat. I normally use looking at people uh, losing the will to live to see if I'm going too quickly or need to back up a little bit. So I will have to rely on non-visual cues this time. So feel free to make comments and all that kind of stuff. We will, there we go. Now, this presentation is for everybody. Uh, it is, but it is focused towards beginners. If you are an experienced Postgres developer, somebody who does a lot of data work and has worked with Perl inside Postgres already, you're probably not going to learn a whole lot here. Uh, I'm not intending it to. This is to help people learn what they can do if they have not done this kind of thing and to hopefully empower them a little bit. But if you already know all the stuff in this presentation and you just want to hang out, you are welcome. If you do not know Perl yet and you want to learn it, I have good news for you. My opinion is Perl is actually pretty easy to learn, but there are a few caveats. If you have not started working with Perl yet and you go out onto the greater web and you look for, how do I do this? You will probably find three to five ways to do it. And most of them will probably be valid. It is not a language where there is one way to do a thing. So I do encourage you to use all the resources out there in the world and learn. Somebody in chat said there might be 40 ways. That might be true. Um, and in fact, I know it's true sometimes. Uh, but also look at if you want to eventually contribute to like say the Perl code of Evergreen, look at how that's written. There are certain conventions that it follows. But if you're writing just for yourself, there are certain best practices that you should follow, but you can kind of have your own style just for your own functions. But if you're looking to contribute back to the community, you should learn the conventions of the community. What will you need to do this kind of stuff? Well, you'll need access to your database, of course, and you will need the appropriate levels of access. There are things you can do with PL Perl that are interesting in MARC records with just read access. But to be honest, the most interesting things involve writing access so that you can update and manipulate records. I think that's kind of common sense, but needs to be said. And the question comes up of when do you want to do this? When do you want to use Perl inside Postgres rather than just standard SQL or at least Postgres's flavor of SQL? And the answer is when either you can't do it with pure SQL or doing so is extraordinarily difficult for some reason. Uh, 
I made the reference in the slide about Rube Goldberg. If you're not familiar with Rube Goldberg machines, feel free to go to YouTube. Uh, there's a fascinating culture of people making extremely convoluted machines to do very simple tasks. And if you find any good ones, feel free to send them to me. I love those. And it can sometimes feel like that when you're using pure SQL. You're trying to do this thing that you know is very simple in something like Perl, which is very strong at string manipulations, and SQL is making it very difficult. So sometimes easier just to drop in a PL Perl function rather than write it in pure SQL. And I always provide the caveat, test servers are your friends. Test on test data, <laughs> don't test on live data, um, always and forever. Uh, the question inevitably comes up in the course of this for new folks, what should I use to edit? My answer is whatever makes sense for you. I prefer the command line, but there are GUI tools out there that work very well. I like PSQL and I use as my text editor Vim by preference, but if you prefer Emacs or Nano or whatever, just use what works for you. It really doesn't matter so long as it accomplishes the job at the end of the day. So, what are PL Perl functions? Well, the simple way of saying it is that a PL Perl function is a bunch of code in the middle of a SQL function that Postgres knows to call out to the Perl interpreter to run. And it will pass parameters into it, just like it would any normal SQL function, and take a returning value from it. So, uh, Chris Sharp mentioned uh, in chat that uh, PG admin is a good graphical tool for Postgres SQL. I think that's probably the most popular one out there, but I know that there are others as well, and I don't really keep track of them. But so here are some of the things you're going to want to work with uh, in order to manipulate mark records inside Perl. These are Perl libraries, mark character set, mark lint, mark field. Uh, I use those periodically, but not with great frequency. But the two at the bottom I've put in red, mark record and mark file XML, those are the meat and potatoes. Those are things you're gonna use all the time if you're manipulating mark records in Perl. And you can bring in other useful libraries, so long as they're available on your system. Uh, Business ISBN is particularly useful for looking at those darn 0, 20 A's and Z's and doing things like converting the 10 digits to 13 digits and all that other stuff so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And things like text CSV, if you have any kind of delimited data you want to conveniently break up and manipulate. Sure, you can split it up manually and do stuff with it, but why reinvent the wheel? So fundamentally, what does Mark Perl do for you? It just takes care of the grunt work. It abstracts manipulating all the little mark level stuff so that you can just focus on the task without doing all of the tiny level stuff yourself. And why? Well, as most people probably know, Mark is stored in Evergreen as Mark XML. And because it's XML, it is also text. And you could manipulate it like text, but A, you're probably going to be building one of those Rube Goldberg machines again pretty soon. And it's probably dangerous. Something that may seem like it's going to be a simple search and replace yeah, you could pretty easily end up with unintended consequences and really start screwing some stuff up. So use tools appropriate to the job, in this case, mark manipulation tools. Now, for those who don't know, we store mark in a few places. These are the what I think of as the most important places mark is in the database. And they are in the record entries for the biblio table, the serial table, and the authority table. 
And the one you're going to use the most probably is the Biblio table. That is where your standard material monographs, DVDs, CDs, your materials are going to live. And then you may use serials and authorities as well, just depending on the needs of your institution. We already mentioned this, MARC is stored as MARC XML. It is important to note, because it pops up occasionally in terms of moving things around, that the actual field data type it is stored in is text, not XML. But that's okay. We have easy ways to work with it. And fortunately, when we pass it through to a function, it is very easy to tell it it's XML and create a MARC record object with it. And now I am going to point you towards the Equinox migration tools. Uh, this is our Git repository. Uh, anybody is welcome in the wide world to clone it and use tools in it. And there is a SQL directory that includes a number of examples of PL Perl functions, as well as standard SQL functions. So uh, in the path, I'm going from memory here, but I believe that if you're in the root of it, it's SQL base uh, to get to the various SQL files. So let's get into the actual mechanics. We're 11 minutes in and we haven't had a code slide yet, so let's start that. Uh, but first, I do want to take just a second to see if, if there are any questions at this point that people have that we should address. I don't think I can see the Q&A window from here when I'm sharing my screen. There's not a Q&A in the oh, meeting. Okay. There's just the chat. Just there's the chat. there's a lot okay. of chat, but uh, I haven't seen any questions so far. Okay. I'm skimming up. I am trying to watch chat while I do it. Um, and I see there's a discussion about PG admin, so. Yes. That may, if you are used, interested in a graphical interface, catch up with the discussion between Blake and Chris about that. Um, and I think Chris said that he uses primarily PSQL plus Vim now. Uh, for people who are deciding what they want to use, if you're primarily coming from a graphical user environment, I can understand if using the command line tools like PSQL and Vim seem intimidating, or PSQL and Nano, PSQL and whatever. Uh, but for pure mobility and being able to jump on any machine you're at and create a shell connection to somewhere and use it, it's really useful. Uh, Bradley mentions Navicat. I'm not familiar with that one personally, but it brings up a good point. There are commercial tools that I'm sure are, are very good as well. Um, do what works for you. I'm not a purist in that regard, despite my occasionally giving Emacs users some grief just because it amuses me. Um, <laughs> but if there aren't questions at this point, we'll return to the code slide, the boilerplate. This is the basic function, the basic layout of a PL Perl function. And if it looks a whole lot like any SQL function, then it should, because it is pretty similar. At the top, create or replace the function. Technically, you don't even need the or replace. Give the name of it. Say what you're going to pass in as parameters, one or more. Say how you're going to return it, what you're going to um, do your Perl declarations. This is going to be different from a standard SQL function because you're going to declare you're using Mark Perl or uh, Mark Record or something else. Then you'll do whatever you're going to do and return from the function back to the environment that called it. And you're going to have a function declaration at the end to say that the function is over and declare the language as PL Perl or PL Perl U. I'm not going to get into much of a discussion about PL Perl versus PL Perl U. I don't think that's really critical for an introduction to it. Uh, suffice it to say, there is a functional difference if you get into some of the ways that Perl is allowed to interact with the wider database environment. And if you run into some, if you are using PL Perl and not PL Perl U, and you run into something you can't do, you should have a discussion with your database administrator about that. And if you really need to do things that way, and if you need it. Um, 
but I will leave that between you and your database administrator and not get into a whole lot of detail of it here. Suffice it to say, uh, I wrote PL Perl U here because it's what I'm used to using, but PL Perl does a lot by itself. And here I'm pointing, for those who don't know, the elephant is the, I don't know if it's unofficial anymore. At one time, the elephant was an unofficial mascot of the Postgres development project. I think it may have been officially adopted at some point. Um, but this is really in that boilerplate, the Postgres parts. Declaring the function and declaring the end of the function. And then the Perl part, as illustrated by the camel walking towards it, is just the stuff in between. So dead simple. Nothing to intimidate people. Um, is anybody feeling kind of over? This is normally in a uh, in-person presentation where I'd look out and look for people nodding when I ask if they're feeling overwhelmed by it. How are people in chat feeling about it? Good? Looking good? Okay. All right. So this is probably the simplest actual PL Pro function in the world that actually does something. Uh, all it does is it say, says it's going to be a function called print title. It's going to take text in as its input because the mark blob is text, the mark XML, and it's going to return text. I'm going to use mark record, mark file XML, mark field, field specifically because I'm going to be looking at subfields in the record. I'm going to declare that I am taking as my first parameter the text blob and declaring the variable XML for it. You don't have to do it this way, but it's a normal Perl convention for taking in a parameter, and you can use it here just like you could in a command line Perl program. And then I'm going to call mark record and say, new from XML, take that text blob and give me a record object, uh, as indicated by that record variable. And then once I have that, I can use the field indicators to say, give me the 245A and shove that into the title variable and return it. So that's all this does. It just prints the title. By itself, not a terribly useful function, but neither is hello world. But it's like Hello World, it demonstrates the basic principles involved. And combined with other functionality, you can build mark reading programs that do quite a bit through this. All right. I'm checking something real quick. Okay. So can the mark pass the parse. Let's see, did I skip a slide? Ah, yeah. So we're going to look at another function now to illustrate something that is functionally useful. This is from migration tools. In fact, I basically just copied and pasted from it, which I mentioned earlier. And this is just one step up from print title. Uh, Mike Risher asked, what is shift? Okay, I'll step backwards a little bit. Uh, this gets into sort of Perl basics. I'm not going to go cover Perl a whole lot here, uh, but in Perl, the sh term shift is a common convention for taking something that's a parameter and taking it off the array or list of parameters that are passed and assigning it to a variable. Exactly what Chris just said in chat. And part of the reason I pointed it out here is it shows that delineation, that this region of text really is Perl in here, not quasi-Perl. So can the mark pass? Well, this is from the actual migration tools. It's one step up from print title, but it does something actually useful. And we're going to, just like the previous one, take in a blob of mark text. And we're going to declare some calling for the mark record libraries and XML and character set. Here, I'm going to assume UTF-8, although I probably don't need that here. And the big difference is this evaluation statement. 
we're going to try to make the record from XML. We're going to call mark record and try to assign it to a variable just like we did before. But in this case, we're not assuming that it's going to work. We're going to evaluate it. And if the evaluation fails, we return zero. If the evaluation succeeds, we return one. So all it really does is say, hey, can mark record successfully pass whatever you're sending to us and make a mark record out of it, a mark record object? Because if it can't, then it's not useful to try to do other things with it. And this can be useful on its own to pass over, say, a collection of bibs and say, are there any bad bibs in here? Are there anything that can't actually be successfully loaded into biblio.record entry or something like that? So we're going to look at an example now of something where this can be useful. And I'm going to use an example of fixed fields. Someone was, and I feel bad, I forget who it was that was asking. Somebody was asking during the herding bibliographic cats presentation yesterday uh, about the tools we use for modifying fixed fields. Ah, Jeremiah, there's you, thank you. And I said I would show them off today, and I will, and there'll be a live presentation of part of it. So let's say you need to change position seven of some characters from M to S in the leader. And I'm not gonna go over how fixed fields work a whole bunch here. Uh, Galen Charlton talked about it in his Making the Most Out of Mark presentation. We talked about it a little bit also in the Herding Cats presentation yesterday. Feel free to go back to those for more detail once we have all these loaded on YouTube. But suffice it to say that if I, in this leader, if I changed the M to an S that is in position seven, that this would be a serial record instead of a monograph record. Now, could you do this with pure SQL? Yeah, you could. You could use a search replace, you could use regex, you could use some posi positioning tricks with SQL. Um, but what if there is some condition somewhere in the record you didn't anticipate? It, it just seems like when there are better tools available, you should use them. And this is a very simple example. What if it's a much more, or even just a little bit more complicated replacement, say with things with repeating fields? Then you're laying the work for landmines. And if you need to learn the tools to deal with the more complicated situations, when they're the right tools to use, and you already need to learn them, you might as well use them for the simple situations too. At least that's my opinion. So, and we're gonna come back to that when we do the practical look at the fixed fields tools. Um, in fact, we can go ahead and do that now. I'll go ahead and skip to here. Can everyone see the terminal screen okay? Do I need to make text a little bit bigger? Um, I can see it, Rogan. You could make it, yeah, a bit larger. Let's see. How is that? That's well, nice and big. Okay. I'm also going to warn you, I think my, uh, I'm using some Bluetooth uh, earbuds for listening, and I think they're about to die on me, even though they should have three hours of charge on them. So uh, I may stop being able to hear you in a little bit, but. Okay, we I'll can pay. type if, yeah. if we can <laughs> <laughs> So let's do this. So the tools I talked about earlier are largely in migration tools schema. Oh. And of course, at this size, let me change to this display. At this size, it's not going to be easy to see them, but you can see their names and there's a whole bunch of stuff in here for different functions. So let's look, this is using the Concerto data set, by the way. And let's look at actually changing a record and we'll look at the PL Perl functions and associated code that works with it to accomplish that as we go. So I'm going to pick on record 248 from Concerto.
For those who do not spend an excessive amount of time in Evergreen test databases, this is Ernest Klein's Ready Player One. It is a monograph book record. And if you want to confirm that Evergreen knows it as a book, here's a little query that will get you that information for the search format. It reads from the Metabib record attribute vector list and then matches to the coded value map and config schema and will tell you what it thinks the search format is. And it says it's a book. So now let's change it. And then after I change it, I will show you the tools that made that happen. So select star from migration tools dot modify biblio fixed fields. Now, if you are wondering why do I reference biblio fixed fields, these tools are in our migration tool set. We sometimes are doing this with records that we haven't loaded into the actual production tables yet. So there are variant functions for referencing stage tables that are not actually part of Evergreen yet. This one actually references biblio.record entry. And let's change it from a book to, I don't know, what do people think? Uh, Ebook, Blu-ray, maybe a piece of music, how's that? It's gonna be wrong, but for demonstration purposes, it's fine. Oh, I did not like something there. So we may have a bug to look at. Interesting. This is always the fun of doing live demos, right? Let's see what happens if I do that to something else. There we go, it liked that more. For those wondering, I also copied that error, so I'll go look at it later, and I may have a patch to apply later today. But that's the nature of software, right? So let's requery that and see what it says it is now. And now it says it's a Blu-ray, which is exactly what we wanted. And if we had the OPAC available for this right here, we could go to it and see the Blu-ray icon and all that kind of fun stuff. So let's look at what makes that possible. Well, first I'm gonna show you the contents of a table. It helps if I spell migration correctly. It's gonna be difficult to see all of this at once, so I'll just go through a little bit of it. But this is a table in the migration tool schema that lists a lot of the fixed field information needed to set search and icon formats for some of the common types that Evergreen uses. Um, Andrea is commenting she's known to take 100 screenshots as live demo insurance. Yeah, I could have done that, but you know, why not live on the edge a little bit, right? Um, Andrea is probably cringing at me saying that right now. But for those not familiar with all the fixed fields in and outs, um, I'm not going to go over all of them right now because we'll be here for a long time doing it. But some of them are very simple and straightforward. Some of them get convoluted. So for example, a lot of people don't realize that with books, yes, it is an item type of A and a bib level of A, but also there are certain item forms in other fields than the leader that cannot have certain values and it still be considered a book. Uh, Meg Stroop says in chat, fixed fields are the fun part. Um, we need to talk some time about your definition of fun, Meg, just saying. But <laughs> that is what this table is meant to represent. The things that can't be uh, recording forms, the things that can't be item forms, if a, it needs a bib level, what that is, uh, what these different physical descriptors have to be, all that kind of stuff. And these things 
depending on what they are, go into 007s, 008s, and the leader. Do these translate to the bib templates? Yes. The bib templates basically are bare bone frameworks of these things. Uh, Blake asked about music. There is music and there are also specific subforms of music. So those multiple variations are accounted for in here. And I'm not going to go through every line, but you can pull the git. Uh, you can pull the migration tools repo. And I didn't say this explicitly up front, but these tools were built to handle the challenges of a specific project. They are a toolbox, but they don't cover every eventuality. In fact, there were things I would have liked to have done in them that just didn't fit within the scope of those projects. So if anybody else uses these tools and builds on top of them because their projects allow them the time to extend them, feel free to send me patches. I will be glad to add them. So that is one critical part of this, and that is the table of different search formats, icon formats, and the fixed field data necessary to represent them. Now, next up is, and I am going to actually pull up the text of it here. The function I actually called is just a, what I call a quality of life function. And that was this. And let's see, I like Vim. And at this size, it's not super convenient to read, but basically I send it the bib ID and the text uh, of what I want the fixed field thing to be. And then it goes through here and queries that search format map table to gather all that information does a little bit of analysis to say what needs to be included or not, and then calls another function called modify fixed fields to actually do the work, just so that I don't have to each time query the ta table manually to send all that row by row information. Just, it's a pure SQL function, just quality of life. The actual function that does the work is, there's very little more fun than mistyping in a live demo. Um, oh, I guess I should have pointed out. Well, I'll just go to it. It doesn't matter. What that function calls is one just simply called modify fixed fields, which doesn't make any assumption about where the record lives, stage table or anywhere else. It lets the function calling it worry about that. And this is a PL Perl function. Just like we showed before with the simpler examples, you create a replace, give the name, declare the parameters being passed in, make your Perl declarations, use strict, use warnings. Uh, I still have data dumper in here, probably from when I was doing testing elsewhere, or maybe I was outputting to, you know, well, it's from my debugging period, you could take it out. For those not familiar, data dumper is used when debugging a lot, uh, just to provide output like, hey, I wanna know what's really ending up in this array. Did I declare the array reference correctly or is it not what I think it is? So you can give yourself the output and look at it, that kind of stuff. Uh, very useful if you're passing around references rather than full objects, which is the, not, the good thing to do a lot of the time. If that sounds like gibberish, and you're early in your Perl career, I do recommend reading up on references and pointers and all that stuff. If you do it early in your life, it will make your Perl coding much easier. And uh, yeah, it'll save you a lot of time. So the rest of this is just stuff. I don't wanna go through it line by line, but I'm pulling in those different parameters, looking at them, seeing where I need to modify the mark leader. Does it even have a 007 or a 008? Do I need to put in you know, a placeholder of the correct length for that type of record, which is gonna vary? And then all the way down towards the bottom, 
I actually start putting all that in and return it out as a mark record and close out the function. And if we actually look at that record, if we look at the mark of it, and I'm used to my text being very small here. This looking at it huge as I type it is kind of weirding me out. But if we look at it now, we can see that one thing the script also does is put in a 919 for a little note that says the record was modified by automated fixed field changes. Which just leaves me a little historical trail to say, hey, this record was touched. And in other data projects like deduplications and things like that, I can make use of that. Yeah. Actually, I did not mean to quit there. So any questions at that point? I've not been keeping up with chat very well. I think you, to... you caught Ruth's question, which was so no questions one. at this point. Yeah, no trying questions. to imagine people nodding their heads. No, we're fine. <laughs> it's all good. That's right. Good. Okay. So I am. Where is where did my presentation slides go to? Mike said he had questions about the syntax, there but that might be more than the than you could do. Can everyone, see this. the presentation slides again. Yep. Can you hear me, Rogan? Oh. Okay. Um, for Mike and Jeremiah, lots of questions about the syntax. Uh, I wasn't planning on going over the Perl in a lot of detail here. Um, ideally for folks, yes, unfortunately, my speakers have gone out. Um, can everyone still hear me okay? I'm gonna try to get them running while I talk again. And I'm very upset because these things are supposed to have a four hour charge and they were completely charged before we started at the 12 o'clock. So I'm kind of worked about that. Yeah, I am, I'm running my microphone off of a, a much older, simple analog uh, mic. So that will not go out. <laughs> of course, the more advanced technology is what's failing me. Um, So, da, 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 da. yeah, uh, but getting back to the syntax, uh, if you have questions about the syntax, feel free to send them to me later. I'll be glad to answer what I can. Um, I'm probably not the best person in the world to teach anybody Perl, but I managed to teach a fair bit of it to myself, so I at least know what I do, but I am not a Perl guru by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but I can explain my own code, for whatever that's worth. Uh, Jeremiah missed most of it. Yeah, don't worry, this video will be up on YouTube, so we will put it up there. And Mike is pointing to the O'Reilly Programming Pearl book. That is a wonderful book. Yes, I do recommend it for anybody learning. Um, I am very fond of that book. It has remained a staple of people learning Pearl for 20 plus years. I don't remember when it was first published, over 20 years ago, and for good reason. Okay, so I was next up after that little side trip into the realm of live demo, uh, going to do another practical example, and this is adding 856 subfield nines. 856 subfield nines, uh, for those who don't know, are a, well, let me back up just a little bit. 856s are parts of MARC records that basically say, here's a resource link. And in Evergreen, when you add a subfield nine onto them, they basically say, hey, only use this link when displaying at these org units. 
So in, in the background, they create a, basically a call number to help control viewing and searching. And it's a convenient way of addressing the need of having electronic resource records like say books from OverDrive or Access 360 or some or uh, um, Hoopla or something like that available in the catalog. And it's not an uncommon thing for you to get a batch of records and perhaps from the vendor and they have the 856s, but you need to add those subfield nines. Uh, Meg Shroop uh, commented, especially helpful in a consortium environment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so what this function is going to do is add a subfield nine. So just like we showed before, and I feel like I'm showing the same things over and over again, but that's the nature of a fundamental. You want to go over it over and over again. Drop the function if it exists create a replace function. I try to name things as confusingly as possible, so I just called it add subfield nine. I'm gonna send it the mark. I'm gonna send it a couple of pieces of text, a partial u and a new nine. So what those are respectively is sometimes a record will have multiple 856s in it, and you don't necessarily want to add your subfield nine to every 856. So this allows sending part of the text that would be in the subfield U to say, only add what's in this new nine variable where it matches, where the U in that same 856 matches the second part. So say a record has several links to loc.gov and one to overdrive, you can just put overdrive in here so it only adds the subfield nine to the overdrive link. And then we have the stock Perl stuff after we declare the function stuff for Postgres, use strict, use warnings, use record, use mark file XML. Uh, once again, we see that shift convention and we had some questions in chat about shift. Last time we used shift once because we were only passing one variable. This time I'm calling it three times because I'm popping each off. There are multiple ways to do this. You actually could declare all three on one line uh, and just point it at the array. There are other ways to pull it. This is how I tend to do it unless I have a whole bunch of them, in which case I might do it a different way. Um, here I'm validating the record and the leader and all that kind of fun stuff just to make sure that everything's uh, kosher and going to process correctly. And then down at the bottom, I have my at URIs. At is a Perl declaration for an array or a list, whatever you want to call it, but basically a series of values. And I'm saying, take the mark XML record and grab me the 856s. And then return unless at, and that is a Perl convention for testing for something being null. So, so long as I manage to put something in there and there actually are 856s, it'll continue. But if it's empty, well, there's no need to continue doing something with a record that doesn't have any of them. So just zap on back and return out. And then I'm doing the work. For each of the fields inside the 856 uh, list of URIs, and these are, and it's important to note, by using mark record, by using mark field, these are not going to be the actual XML nodes. These are mark record and mark field objects that you're going to be manipulating by those rules. So you can go to Meta CPAN and look up the documentation on them, look in migration tools for examples, but it's pretty straightforward. You know, grab the field and grab the subfield U, and I'm storing it in SFU variable. Grab field indicator two, because in Evergreen, we care about what the indicators are for actually using them. We test for the indicators. We test for the subfield U uh, matching or having a partial match to our matching text. In other words, is it actually an overdrive record or something else that we want to ignore? And if it is, add in our subfield nine to that particular 856 and then pop out of there. 
and then at the very end, with the mark having been manipulated, return as an XML record. Because remember that mark XML is not an actual XML record per se, despite my naming convention here. I probably should have just called it mark record or record or something. Uh, but it is a record object. So we want to render it back as XML to return it back to Postgres to save it in the record entry table. And then I tend to be lazy. I don't want to actually worry about pulling the mark out of the record and passing it. So I tend to create a simple little SQL function to just give it the bib ID and then the partial and the subfield nine text. So, and let it handle the rest for me. Because why introduce human error into something you're gonna do over and over and over again? And that's all this does, just handles pulling the mark XML, sending it to the PL Perl function, getting the XML back and updating the Biblio record entry table with it. And this is an example, you know, select add subfield nine, pass it the bib ID, say I want to test for liveoverdrive.com being in the subfield U, and if it's there, add a subfield nine of main lib. And that's it. And I should be able to hear folks again, by the way. So, so that is the end of the presentation. We have about five to 10 minutes left where I can take questions and chat um, before I have to surrender the space for the next presenters, um, which I believe are Galen and Mike, who are gonna be talking about making use of Perl and Evergreen. So they'll probably be talking about more intermediate to advanced stuff than I have been. Um, and I suspect it'll be pretty interesting. So I hope uh, people who are interested in this stuff stick around for their presentation. I'm not sure why Pearl Jam is continuing, but, oh, Pearl Jam, I got it. That took me a minute. But I do like Pearl Jam. In fact, I was listening to um, a live the other day. So <laughs> uh, I do remember the 90s. Uh, uh, and actually, I still listen to Pearl Jam quite a bit. Uh, uh, I'm not sure which album it's from, but uh, along with a live, I was listening to their three part Dance of the Clairvoyance recently, which I really have enjoyed. <laughs> but probably not here to listen to my uh, musical tastes. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and, and I apologize for having the captioner have to type out clairvoyance. Um, <laughs> but I'll be glad to hang out a few minutes for uh, any questions or discussion and when uh, uh, the hosts are ready to take it back over, feel free to do so. Thanks, Rogan. Can you hear me? I can. While I was talking, okay. I recharged my headphones enough to get at least 20 more minutes to charge from them. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> well, um, I guess we'll see if anybody has any questions. And then in case you need to browse through your slides, I won't take back the slides yet. but. Or take and as, the, yeah, and as others have said, these slides will go up on um, the website, and I will do some editing to add in a few slides with the live demo stuff we did. Oh, great. Yep, you're getting lots of uh, great job, kudos. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I don't think we have any questions at this point. Uh, I, I think Chris said earlier, people were welcome to post an IRC and ask a mailing list. Absolutely do so. Feel free to zap me a message if you have a specific question or you don't feel comfortable with it on a public list. Uh, but do feel comfortable too. I mean, the Evergreen community is pretty friendly, so.
I will mute myself and allow the transition to begin. Thank you all for coming. Have a good day. Thanks, Rogan.